Humble Mug. For the last couple of decades, we've been living in an increasingly fast-paced environment. And in the age of social media, thoughts and discourse on video games is also a rapidly moving and dynamic beast. Go on Twitter for even a few days and it's like watching this fascinating speedrun of people's opinions coming and going. One week, everyone will be gushing about how monumental of a game Super Mario 64 was, and then the next week, everyone's talking about how it's actually not that great and, to be honest, was overhyped. Observing people arguing on that platform is like watching single-cell microorganisms splitting and reforming rapidly and creating a society within a week. If the microorganisms used to build that society were rage bait posts, hot takes, and ratios. Huh, maybe don't go to Twitter. I like to think of myself as acutely aware of just how volatile and sometimes outlandish discussions on video games can actually be, being someone who grew up on forums like Game Talk during the dawn of the modern internet, but even I have gotten swept up in the hype or the hate for a lot of games over the course of my lifetime. And I realized kind of recently that I'm not actually as good at filtering through the nonsense as I thought I was. The unfortunate side effect of this is that in the past, I have let my own preconceived notions, as well as groupthink, influence me greatly on the types of gaming decisions I've made. Even worse, I've caught myself parroting popular opinions about games I actually knew nothing about. When I was writing my script for my Gauntlet video, I wrote about how games like Castlevania 64 were considered not so great in comparison to the 2D outings that were the poster children of that IP previously. I had never played Castlevania 64 at the time of writing that script, but it seemed like a safe thing to say because everyone around me in real life or online seemed to be validating that thought. But then when I actually played the first level in order to get some footage for the game, I was utterly shocked at how much I was enjoying it. I played way longer than I intended to. I was too deep in the production of my Gauntlet video to go back and rewrite and re-record everything at that point, so I included a footnote there just to clarify that I was personally digging the game despite the discourse just to make myself feel better. Now, Earthworm Jim 3D, on the other hand, another game I use as an example here for unsuccessful transitions from 2D to 3D, yeah, I think I stand by that. But my brief experience with Castlevania 64 reinforced something that I believe we all know but often forget from time to time. Sometimes, the opinion of the masses is still just that, an opinion, no matter how ubiquitous it seems. And that means there's always a possibility that it's wrong or at least a little overblown. Suddenly, I was questioning everything I thought I knew about that franchise, and overnight I went from not even considering playing 3D Castlevania titles, because some guy somewhere told me that they don't hold a candle to the 2D ones, to now seeing Castlevania Lords of Shadow on sale in the Xbox store as an insta-purchase. And now I want to be a part of that wave of people who, in response to Konami releasing the Castlevania Dominus collection, say, Konami, this is awesome. Now, if we could also get a collection of the 3D titles, and those WiiWare ones too, life would be complete. Watching my own perceptions of a certain sect of a popular gaming franchise totally flip and do a complete 180 over this year has been precisely one of the many reasons I was excited to start this channel. To discover games I missed out on previously, was ignorant to the existence to, or had the wrong perception of in the past. Once you actually take the time to go back in history, you'll realize that many of the games that received a lot of postmortem flack years after their release often had at least decent reviews at the time of their release. Castlevania 64 had reviews that average out to a decent to strong seven. In many cases, my absolute favorite Twitter account, Quest64 Official, has shown on many occasions how people have tried to rewrite history on the perception of Quest64. It received some bad reviews, yes, but it also received its fair share of high praise by legitimate gaming apps outlets, and some of those reviews aren't even included in its average rating score on sites like Wikipedia. It was only until later that a lot of the rhetoric changed and suddenly Quest 64 went from being this slightly above average game to being considered one of the Nintendo 64's worst games ever, somehow. I remember people absolutely tearing apart 2013's DMC, The Devil May Cry reboot, saying, you know, this isn't my Devil May Cry, but one of my good friends who I really respect the opinion of told me that he thought it was actually really fun, and yeah, I think depending on your perspective going into it, it can be a really good time. And speaking of reboots, I remember seeing a big shift in the discourse on the opinions surrounding 2008's Prince of Persia reboot. I believe this was around the time that Prince of Persia The Lost Crown came out earlier this year, and when I started seeing the gameplay and how well the graphics of that game have aged, I thought, you know what, that game looks kinda sick. But despite some pretty good reviews, that game never seemed to really be able to get out of the shadows that the Sands of Time trilogy cast. Resident Evil 5 was absolutely lambasted by critics and fans alike, and understandably so, it does trade a lot of survival horror for straight up action movie scenes. Ultra Combat! 
And 10 years from now, no one's going to forget about how a jacked up Chris Redfield punched a boulder. But kind of like how I think a lot of people see Super Paper Mario, RE5 is considered by a lot of people to be the one in the franchise that, while maybe not a terrible game, it was the catalyst for what's often considered a downward spiral or dark period in one of their favorite franchises. Oh. Super Paper Mario is sick though, try it. But again, time is a valuable thing. You watch it fly by as the pendulum swings, and I've seen many remark that if you look at RE5 more like an action co-op game, it's a super fun experience. Remember, we're a team. Whatever happens, we stick together. Don't worry. I may not be as big as you, but I can still hold my own. And even more recently, much larger creators like G-Man Lives put his name on the line to talk about how well the game holds up for the most part, boulder punching and all. And I just want you to look back at all of the games I've just talked about. At the time of their release, they all received their fair share of roses. It's really only in a retrospective sense that many look back after a couple of years and say that these games actually weren't that great, and then that opinion permeates and spreads like this vicious game of telephone for the better half of a decade. Then that begins to affect popular opinion, and now, who knows how many people have turned a blind eye to a gaming experience they may have really enjoyed because of people just parroting popular opinions. Looking back at all of these games myself, I felt a little shame within because I was only two for six. Missed. Out of the six games I just talked about, I only played two prior to learning about the public opinion of said game later. The first being Quest 64, and truth is, my brother and I were always Quest fans, and Super Paper Mario still might be my favorite in the series to be honest. I plan on making in-depth videos about both of these games one day, so make sure you're subscribed if you want to see that by the way. But the other four games, I have to admit I overlooked them at one point or another, and that's in large part due to the negativity that I heard. My prediction, and it's not even all that hot of a hot take, but my prediction is that Final Fantasy XIII will be one of those games that gets more respect as time goes on. Hate for that game, especially from hardcore Final Fantasy fans, was unavoidable at the time of its release, it's still being talked about. And like any of the other games that I just mentioned, yeah it's not perfect, but the people who resonated with the good that's in that game seem to have really resonated with it. And I've already seen inklings of more positive discussions surrounding the game seeping into the zeitgeist already, and in a similar fashion Final Fantasy X is also known for being quite linear. What? Don't cry. Similar to Final Fantasy XIII, but that game is also getting its roses too. I think Final Fantasy XIII is going to be another. We just can't catch a break, can we? Are Prince of Persia 2008, Devil May Cry 2013, Resident Evil 5, Castlevania 64, Super Paper Mario, and Final Fantasy XIII the best games in their respective series? Fixing a dish me already, huh? Maybe not. But is there something of value there for those open to experiencing those games? Probably. Does Quest 64 need a sequel or a modern reboot? Does a bear shit? Okay, so you get the point. What I want to encourage you guys to do is trust your gut, especially when it comes to a game from an earlier time that you usually can get for cheap, thus with minimal risk, because yes, as old as what I'm about to say may make you feel, PS3 and Xbox 360 games are from an earlier time at this point. That game you just copped for $10 now might be more enjoyable to play in this moment than it was back then, because you're not saving up and shelling out your whole allowance for this game anymore. You've probably got a more nuanced perspective on games now, and playing a game from 2008 for the first time might be a refreshing change of pace, or at least some sort of time capsule that allows you to experience secondhand nostalgia, which is my favorite thing as of late. And if you don't know what secondhand nostalgia is, by the way, check out the video I I just made. I'll leave a link to it in the description for you. Though from a developer's perspective we live in a sort of tumultuous time where studio closures seem imminent and crunch time can get in the way of creative vision, on the consumer side specifically, I think we're living in the best time to be gamers. We have access to over 50 years of games at our fingertips, from games that feel retro or primitive to games that feel quite modern even today, to actual modern classics that are absolutely killing it in recent years and deserve to be in the spotlight, to hidden gems that are old to some but new to you. Through legitimate or not so legitimate means, the ease of access to these all-time greatest games ever made is higher than ever. And no hate to any of these creators, but that's why I kind of do get upset when I see these videos that talk about how games just aren't fun anymore. Because I've learned through my own lived experience trying to prep myself for the creation of this channel over the last two years or so, and finally launching it this year, is that if you don't find games fun, you are either simply overdoing it and maybe need to take a break or spend time doing another hobby which is fine, or you just aren't looking hard enough and diving into the depths far enough to see what is out there that's worth exploring. And the craziest part about all of this is that 
At one point, I myself wondered if games were even fun anymore. And now, fast forward a couple years later, I legitimately see games with the same kind of wonderment that I did when I was a kid. I've played so many games recently that have absolutely captured my imagination and let it run wild. And finding that harmony between my adult self and my inner child has resulted in an even greater appreciation of games because now both the logical adult side and the imaginative child side of me can often come to agreements with one another and say, damn, Psychonauts was awesome. And that's a really cool feeling. And there are many games I'm trying and enjoying now that had I listened to what everyone online seems to be saying, I probably would have never given them a chance. So as I said a second ago before I went on many semi-coherent tangents there, trust your gut. If it looks like something that's up your alley, it's probably worth checking out. And the mindset hack that I've found that makes games so much more enjoyable to me is that I go in there looking for things to enjoy. I approach a game with an open mind, expecting to have a good time. Maybe the game is a slow burn, or maybe it grips my attention from the very first scene, but something in there will be enjoyable. And if I give it an honest go and it just doesn't resonate with me, that's okay because I can say I tried. That doesn't mean that it's a bad game. But one thing I know for sure is that if I dive into a game with all of the criticisms I've heard from the popular discussions surrounding said game burning in the back of my mind, of course I'm not going to enjoy it. All of this sounds simple, and if you have already mastered this ability within yourself, I commend you because it makes life in general easier. But this is something that I think more people need to hear, especially in today's social media age where opinions on things are so black and white, so polarizing, where a game or a song or a movie or anything else is either terrible or a masterpiece with nothing in between. Some of my personal favorite gaming experiences, not the ones I objectively can step outside of myself and identify as the best quote unquote gaming experiences, but honestly many of my personal favorite gaming experiences and memories have come from games largely considered 6s out of 10s and 7s out of 10s. Social media hyper users and journalists and YouTubers may have you think that there's no room for 6s and 7s in an age where a game like Rise of Kong or Concord and a game like any of these games that also released in this same general time period get more coverage, but there is and we need more of those 6 and 7 out of 10 games. Opinions come and go about games like waves, either waves of hate or waves of praise, so it's up to you to choose which body of water you want to wade in and spend your time in. Do your best to not let the waves shake you, and instead find your own happiness and form your own opinion. Whether you're playing games from the Sega Master System, the TurboGrafx-16, a PlayStation 2, an Xbox 360, the Wii U, PS5, Switch, PC, whatever your platform of choice is in this moment, there is something there that's going to grab your heart and your soul and it's gonna hold on. If you're in a rut and haven't found it yet, chances are it's out there waiting for you just hoping to be discovered. I don't know who needed to hear this, but if you're watching this and feel like it's you, I sincerely hope this helps, and I hope your future days are filled with experiences new and exciting. As the saying goes, all I know is that I don't know nothing, and the sooner you realize that, the more interesting life becomes. If you're still here, thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay humble.